Did you know that you can get tuberculosis in your spine? Yes, and it's called pot disease. Yesterday I presented the case of a 30 year old man who came to the emergency department with progressive back pain, fevers, and weakness and numbness in his bilateral lower extremities. I showed this x-ray of his thoracolumbar spine that shows a gibbous deformity of T12 and L1. What's a gibbous deformity? It's a form of structural kyphosis where one or more vertebrae become wedged. It's classically described and associated with tuberculosis in the spine. I showed this MRI without contrast of his thoracolumbar spine that shows extensive infection in his T12 and L1. The enhanced MRI of his lumbar spine also shows diffuse enhancement of these infected vertebrae, as well as severe spinal compression. In addition to the spondylodiscitis, I showed an example of what's called a cold abscess, which is also seen in tuberculosis. So let's go through the case and the explanation. Tuberculosis has been described in ancient times as early as 1000 BC. It's a serious airborne infection caused by the bacteria called mycobacterium. It's spread by air droplets, so when one person coughs, another person can inhale those droplets and catch the disease. It spreads easily in crowds. Even though it's not incredibly prevalent in the United States, there are many other countries where it's pretty common. Tuberculosis is one of India's major public health concerns. 2020, India accounted for 26% of all tuberculosis cases worldwide. Tuberculosis is most commonly a disease of the lungs, but it can spread to any organ in the body. Symptoms include coughing, fatigue, weakness, night sweats, chills, shortness of breath, and loss of appetite. People that have a weakened immune system are more susceptible to tuberculosis. So how does tuberculosis spread to other organs, including your spine? Like most infections that get into your spine, it's typically spread through your blood. It's also called hematogenous spread. Our discs are the cushion that sits between the bones in our spine. And what you may not know about these discs is that they are not well vascularized. This is showing the blood vessel flow within the bones above and below our disc, but within the disc itself, there's not a lot of blood flow. If bacteria get in your bloodstream and somehow make its way into the disc, it's almost like a safe haven. It can get in there and flourish, and it's really hard to get rid of it. The infection can build up within the disc itself and spread into the bone above and below the disc, and that's called spondylodiscitis. This is a really great picture that kind of describes that process as the infection gets into the disc, causes the discitis and it can continue to flourish into a osteomyelitis known as Pott's disease. You can see where that infection can mold the two bones together and that's called the gibbous deformity. As the infection spread, it can also spread posteriorly and cause spinal cord compression like in our patient. I showed that spot on our patient's back that was similar to this and this is called a cold abscess. Why is it cold? I'm sure at some point in your life, you have either seen someone with an abscess or had one yourself, and you know that those things can get hot and painful. We call them cold abscesses because they lack the inflammatory component. They can be under the skin, on the chest wall, and in the spine, they can be prevertebral abscesses or paraspinal abscesses. That means pockets of pus that surround the spine. Back to our case, our patient has severe infection of his T12 and L1 vertebrae. He's got severe spinal compression that's causing weakness and numbness in his legs, and if it's not treated, he could potentially be paraplegic. Here you can see the spinal cord, which is the gray thing through here, severely compressed by this infected bone. With severe cord compression and neurological decline, surgery is really our best option for this patient. Most surgeons in this case would perform what's called a vertebral corpectomy. That's a procedure where we go in through an incision on the patient's side and remove the affected disc. And then we can subsequently place a cage or bone graft to replace the vertebral body that we removed. Here's what that would look like in a cartoon format. Here is a CT scan of someone that's had a T12 and L1 corpectomy with posterior screws that you can see above and below that cage. By removing that infected bone, you can decompress the spinal cord and stabilize this unstable spine as well as correct his natural curvature because he lost that when these two vertebral bodies collapsed. 
Surgery will also allow us to sample the infected material and send it to the microbiology lab so we can determine what the infection is. And in this case, it was mycobacterium, which is tuberculosis. Bonus points if you know what type of stain we do to check for tuberculosis. If you guessed AFB, you got it right. Would you believe me if I told you we treat this with chemotherapy also? What? Mycobacterium tuberculosis is a slow-growing bacillus. That's unlike a lot of other bacteria because this means antibiotics don't work as well. Most antibiotics are not able to penetrate the cell wall of the mycobacterium. The multiple drug approach is necessary. Typically, a four drug regimen is used to treat pot disease. Isoniazid and rifampin are drugs that we typically use as first line. Pyrazinamide, ethambutol, and streptomycin are the additional drugs that can be used. The duration of how long we give patients these drugs is somewhat controversial. In our patient, he had a rapidly progressive myelopathy with cord compression and underwent a vertebral corpectomy of those infected bones with a spinal fusion. This was followed by a four-dose drug regimen to help fight the bacterial infection. He initially regained some strength but is still undergoing rehabilitation. Lessons to be learned is that tuberculosis is a very contagious airborne disease and it's recently shown a significant resurgence in developed nations. Improving awareness of this global health threat is incredibly important. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. I hope you guys learned something this week. Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case.